Josh Pate, I mean, late kick with Josh Pate on YouTube. Um, you're everywhere. How you doing, my man? All those accolades, and I'm the only one chewing gum in your microphone. <laughs> so let me spit it out right <laughs> quick. Yes, you know, <laughs> whatever, however you want to present. How, you know how, what I mean? how, how red is the back of your neck about to be after I mean, you sit here today? I feel like an ant under a magnifying glass. I put 50 SPF just on the back of my neck in preparation <laughs> for this. The visual is something that the audience, I, you got it. Okay, so we got the visual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're we got all. The, we got yeah. the visual. This is called backlighting, everyone. Backlighting. Backlighting. Not so much front lighting. Oh, my God. Uh, so Texas is rolling in here today what's yeah, happening man what are your what are your thoughts on the horns uh well, i got football thoughts but no one wants to talk about football it's been all existential it's been all like fifty thousand feet how does texas fit into the culture have you been here all week have you guys been oh here all man week? yep okay so you, you've heard the question's been a little odd yeah very nonsensical uh, you say odd i'm not as kind to some of these <laughs> folks so i have found in in texas's brief time in the sec uh, they haven't played a game yet here. I have found it's really impossible to have a reasonable, logical conversation about them because no one really wants to. It's either if you're a Texas sucks, Texas going to get chewed up by the SEC, or Texas is about to run roughshod over this thing. And there's, you know, there's this middle ground, a.k.a. the entire world is in the middle of those two takes. And there's this possibility where Texas is one of a handful of really good to potentially elite teams in any given year in the conference. They recruit the way you have to do to not only compete in, but win the conference. Um, Sark, when we were there in spring, and I'm sure you guys have talked about this ad nauseum, I made sure to have him highlight the difference in just offensive line, year one, the way they couldn't even practice like they wanted to, to now they had 17, 18 bodies, counting walk-ons, that they could use to, you know, have real practices, have real scrimmages. That kind of stuff matters. I don't think the public really cares about that. That's not a flashy headline or a thumbnail, but that matters. Um, him having been where he's been matters because he's observed it being done at the highest level. I think uh, two things to me stand out about him. First off, aside from his entire personal story, the first thing is if you think about this, guys, so think about having a, a shot as a Power 5 head coach and you get a couple of jobs and then for whatever reason your bosses don't think you're good enough anymore so they fire you. And you have your own personal issues. Then you get a shot. Then you get a shot to, well, you worked for the Falcons for a second, and then he was at Alabama as the offensive coordinator. Does a great job. Just get to that point as a coach. If you're ever going to be a head coach again, history tells us it's probably going to include a stop at a G5, like Hugh Freeze had to do at Liberty. Yep. If you're working your way back up, it's probably going to include a stop there. Or Florida Atlantic. Sark like never Lane. had to do it. Sark right. went from assistant at Alabama straight to one of the premier jobs in the entire sport, and so – I think, I think to myself, and I talked to him about this when we were over there in the spring, what if you had to take that middle step in an era where the better you do at a G5 job, the more you get punished? Because now your roster just gets raided. The better you do at developing your players, the more likely it is that at the 11th hour, someone up the stream whiffed on recruiting, they come take your guys, and all of a sudden you go 4-8 and eight the next year, and no one wants to talk about the why. Everyone just thinks you are what your record says you are. You're a bad coach. My point there is maybe Sark gets in those weeds and never really emerges right. back to the top. Right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is understanding uh, probably, you know, stuff like Jimbo didn't understand fully at A&M, just the organizational day-to-day -day of, of the difference between go getting a whole lot of good players and kind of competing with them to taking them and building a premier program and that stuff's in between that's the mortar between the bricks you can go get the pallets of bricks and that's great but that's not a house you got to know how to build the house and so he gets that stuff those are no guarantees that you're going to do anything it's just without those it's a guarantee you'll never do anything so that's the starting point but i doubt that he'll spend much time talking about those sorts of things today instead it's going to be what kind of what kind of food you interested in when you go back to Alabama, Coach? Yeah, that's <laughs> which is fine. There's a place Nonsense. for Nonsense. There's a place for it. Talking to Josh Pate, uh, late kick with Josh Pate on YouTube. Um, Josh and Sark, when he laid out his his plan in his interview with Texas, he talked about building the culture and telling his story and using the culture Wednesdays and waiting, not doing it the first year, waiting until he had enough of his guys to feel like he could build that culture. And that's why they got over the top last year. Cause there were some, they couldn't finish games his first year. And then last year they had big leads and maybe defensively they played off a little bit 
and ended up in some tight games, but they finished. Now they, they go into the SEC where they're going to play Oklahoma and they're going to play Georgia back to back. Um, where, do, where do you see Texas? What do you think about them football wise going into this year? And, and what are the expectations? Uh, my expectations for them to compete to win the conference, they're, um, they're on par with anyone in the conference. There, there are a couple of teams. Bama's been this way forever. Uh, Georgia's in that conversation. Texas joins the league. They'll immediately be in that conversation of knowing um, you enjoy benefit of the doubt, I guess. Uh, Missouri, I'm going to come back to them because I think they're a good counterpoint. So Texas will be like a Georgia in that, you know, you, you guys know you lose big time premier impact players on the defensive line. Most of America does not know the names of the guys in the aggregate that will replace those folks. But they will blindly trust that they're going to get the job done because they have that kind of respect for Texas and how they've recruited and how they develop. That's the way it is at Georgia. That's the way it is at Alabama. Ohio State's that way. Uh, Missouri, conversely, is not that way. So Missouri, they got high expectations this year. And I find it really interesting that folks were applying a Georgia, Bama, Texas standard to Missouri because they lost big time players too. Missouri is typically not the place where you just blindly assume they'll reload. Missouri's a rebuild place, not a reload place. Historically, maybe this year counters the norm. But at Texas, um, yeah, the other thing about Texas is when we talk about these teams, a lot of times people want to hone in on the weakness area. There's no team void of it. It's just that the best ones have so much plus signs on the piece of paper that they can use it to cover up whatever those relative weaknesses are. And the other thing is, a Texas weakness would be a strength for some teams even in the SEC, much less the rest of the country. Uh, what it all comes down to to me is there were times when they played in the Big 12, no matter how much you tried to hammer it in people's minds that you play to a standard, you play to a standard, you play to a standard. You could tell there were times in the Big 12 when they knew it was a tightrope walk every week, but it was like 10 feet above the ground. This is a tightrope walk like 10 stories above the ground. When the level of play consistently ups itself week over week, uh, it's the same. Like playing football is the same, just like that tightrope walk is the same. Everything about executing is the same. There's a different mentality, though, when you know you're only 10 feet above the ground because you know you can afford to fall. Frankly, Texas knew they could afford to play C-plus, B-minus football against several teams in conference and still find a way to escape, but escape with a win. The thing about playing just a random team like Kentucky or a random team like Mississippi State is their record any given year may be 500. But then you watch the NFL draft in the spring and they send four or five guys to the draft. They're just that much better, which means you've got to up your level of play that much better. That's not even to mention the Oklahoma-Georgia stretches back to back. That's not even to mention the playing Bama, Florida, then randomly going on the road to play arrested South Carolina any given year. That kind of stuff wears on you. And it doesn't mean you can't win it. Texas will be favored in most of the games they play this year or any year. It's just that there's a little bit more fine of a tightrope walk with more consequences if you play, you know, anything less than a B to a B plus level game on a Saturday because you'll be everyone's Super Bowl. Yeah. Josh, you know, Quinn Ewers probably has the most pressure on him than any quarterback in the nation. One, because he's a quarterback at the University of Texas, but two, because of his backup is that household name. How do you think Quinn's going to do this year, and how do you think he's going to deal with all the hoopla that's going on in the outside media world? I think it's a good thing he dealt with everything he's dealt with so far. You know, there's been pressure on him since he's been in high school. Uh, there was pressure at Ohio State, and then that worked out the way it worked out. So. Having a spotlight on you is nothing new for him. That's one of the benefits of having proven production at the quarterback position. Also, you don't you don't go to Texas by accident, if that makes any sense. You know, the guy, guys that don't embrace that spotlight don't just trip up and happen to find themselves at Texas. You got to be seeking that out. So you already have to be cut from a little different cloth to begin with. And that's not even to mention the physical tools he has. The way that I've described you, yours is having all the physical tools and you, maybe you want a little more consistency. Maybe you think there's 10 to 15% more that he could add on the top of his game. Or maybe you think it's already there and you just have to have it pulled out of him as his, um, or this, this 2024 season. But I learned a while back that whatever your team has offensively, if it's led by Steve Sarkeesian, I'll blindly trust that whatever the maximum potential is to be pushed or pulled out of an offense, he'll pull out of it. And then when we get to the finish line, if a guy I had high expectation for still comes up short, and it's not because of injury, it's just because his performance wasn't there, maybe my expectation level was a little too high. 
uh, because I know how that offensive staff goes about doing things, and they don't leave a lot on the table in terms of potential. They don't leave a lot on the table. That doesn't mean they'll be perfect, and it doesn't mean every player will live up to preseason expectation. It's just that the maximum potential of any given team any given year is going to include a lot of guys not living up to expectation because everyone is glass half full this time of year. That's not ever how a football season plays out. That's why everyone bets overs and hardly anyone bets unders in summer, and then everyone goes broke uh, because glass half full is not the world we live in. So I think that he's got a chance. Well, he's got a chance to do everything. He's got a chance to be a Heisman guy. He's got a chance to make himself a multi-multi-millionaire generationally after this year. He's got a chance to win a national championship. And wh whichever quarterback's the first one that does that at Texas in this new generation uh, will be a legend forever there. Talking to Josh Pate, late kick with Josh Pate. And Josh, you had a great interview with Steve Sarkeesian. People uh, need to go to YouTube and just, you know, put in Josh Pate, Steve Sarkeesian. Um, it was a great interview. In fact, that was when he said, you know, we want to make it to where players love it here so much that they never want to leave. Um, what, what impressed you most or... You know, what was your biggest takeaway from that interview? Yeah, everybody's trying to do that. Uh, there's there's stuff that the public misconstrues as coach speak just because they hear everyone say it. But it's not coach speak. Like the non-negotiables, um, offense, defense, special teams, solid line of scrimmage play, solid on special teams. Everybody says this stuff. Well, that's because that's what it takes to win. That's why they all say it. Well, the culture part. That's like a buzzword that everyone thinks is overused now, but it's not. It's mandatory. You've got to have a really good one. What he's talking about there is it, in the long run, if you have a ton of money, you could just go buy a lot of players. You could. Uh, we've seen very high-profile examples of people doing that in the last three or four years. Then you check back on that class two or three years later, and hardly any of them are there. That's, that's not the adhesive. Money is not the adhesive that attracts winning players that build a winning culture. The, the, the players don't build it. The culture is built, and then it attracts the players. It, it's an age where you can use inducement, you can use NIL, but that's not, at the end of the day, what's going to win. That's why I kind of laugh at a lot of the conversation in the college football public space right now of folks thinking, well, if you just got the deepest pockets, that's what it's going to take to win. It doesn't hurt to have it. That's not how you build a winning organization. And so what I think Sark was talking about is, uh, forget about what the you know the narrative is nationally. Uh, NIL is a, a strength. We're going to use it. But at the end of the day, we've got to build a thing that once we get someone's attention and once we get them to come over here and, and buy into us and sample what we have to offer, they got to feel more than, you know, some paycheck. They've got to feel Texas. Like, that's, that's what they've got to buy into. And when they do that, just like they have at a place like Georgia, number one, you find that kids come there at a discount. Uh, because ultimately what you're selling to them is 40 years and not, you know, four months or four years. And number two, you find that when it's time in the fourth quarter and, and it's tied up 23 all and you were favored by 17 and a half on this Saturday, but it's been really, really rough and you just hadn't brought your fastball. And when it's time to go over the cliff, you know, when it's time to remove the front of the fan and just stick your face in it, <laughs> the guys who are there for a paycheck are the ones that are, you know, slumped back on the sideline. The ones that are there for the right reasons, those are the ones. Dog tired uh, will absolutely be in the training room tomorrow and Monday and maybe Tuesday, but you know you can count on those guys. Those guys aren't there because you just happened to offer them the biggest number. Those guys are there because they bought into Texas. So that's what he's talking about. Which rival schools that Texas will have to face this year has the better chance of beating the Horns, A&M or Oklahoma? Oh, this is, there's no right answer. There's, cause There's I, not. Because that, I know. Um, That's why you get to pay the big bucks, though. I think, I I guess I'd go with Oklahoma. I don't know. A and M's a wild card, total wild card team. Normally, uh, so my answer is Oklahoma. So people don't accuse me of not giving an answer. <laughs> but at the same time, I, you you guys, well, you guys obviously remember when they went up to Arkansas two years Ooh. ago, and no one else thinks about the game. But if if you try and recreate in your mind sort of what the atmosphere could be like on that last Saturday. It's a Saturday game, right? Yep. Yep. Last Saturday in the season. That's the closest comparison I can come to. Yeah. And it may be turned up a notch or two from that. So that's maybe the answer is A&M. But my point is with Elko and with A&M, uh, 
normally when you have a guy get fired, not retiring like Saban did, when a guy gets fired and a new coach comes in, normally history has taught us that means he's got to sort of torch the barn and kill the rats, as Meemaw would say. He's got to start building it from the ground up his way. Well, Elko doesn't have to do that. Uh, he, he's got to change some things, but it's like a 20-degree course correction or maybe a 30-degree. It, it's not a, all right, let's reinvent this thing from the color scheme up which means you're dangerous in year one because that guy understands organization like his predecessor didn't that guy understands eval and development not just going and landing the kid like his predecessor may not have so i don't know what that's that's a, like a year two three four projection but they may be good enough at the end of year one to get it done i say oklahoma only because i've been around here all week and i've i've listened all spring and summer and everyone's just totally happy to write them off and their offensive line is going to be terrible and so seven and a half eight wins yeah that total sounds about right and i don't know in my lifetime it feels like oklahoma's had that kind of expectation on them a dozen times i don't remember them underachieving against it very often so also that game is its own season i've been to it two times in the last three years it's ohio state michigan feels the same way and that you talk about it all year and then you've you know it's not the first game of the year so you've watched both teams play so you think you've got to read on them and then you walk in the stadium that morning and both of those have been 11 a.m. noon kickoffs for a while. And so you're, you're like walking in, and it's 9, 10 a.m., and you're, you watch the teams arrive, and you watch folks warm up, and you feel how tense the atmosphere is. People eating funnel cakes and yes. corn dogs. But you, can, you can feel in your mind, like, I, you know, all season I've built up how I think this game's going to go. And all I've used is what they've done on the field so far. It feels like the world started this morning. It feels like nothing matters. It feels like nothing else aside from, from you know, what happens an hour from now, two hours from now matters. And technically, like, you know, stat nerd types will tell you that's not true. They'll tell you those games historically play out the way they would if they were non-rivalry games. You'll just never sell me on that. You'll never – I'm, I'm not saying the, the better team doesn't win most of the time, but the way they feel and the way certain guys rise to the occasion and maybe certain guys kind of – uh, this ain't quite for me. Uh, you don't find that respectfully when Texas is just playing Tennessee. That's a huge game, but you wouldn't find that dynamic the same way as you do against Oklahoma. So, I guess my answer is Oklahoma A and M. That that that's my that's my answer. <laughs> but I I've 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 been fortunate to cover Super Bowls and Wimbledon and the Masters and NBA Finals. That is the greatest game day atmosphere in sports. I got sold on. It. Uh, it's number one to me. I got sold on it. I grew up in Iron Bowl country. I grew up 40 minutes away from Auburn. So Iron Bowl was just, they didn't have to force feed it to me. I sought it out my whole life, and I, that, it'll, never, it'll never decrease in its value to me. Then I got to go to Ohio State, Michigan several times in a row uh, recently, and that's, that's its own world too. But my favorite rivalry game in college football is OU Texas. Or Texas, excuse me, Texas OU. Texas OU is my favorite <laughs> game. Um, because there's a unique dynamic there that doesn't exist anywhere else. And I'm normally against neutral site games. I don't even like that Georgia, Florida has played neutral site, but that one is the exception. There's a, an exception to every rule. That's the exception to my rule there. I am so glad that like my job has afforded me the opportunity to go experience that. Cause candidly, I used to always scoff at it a little bit when I was growing up and I would see, you know, that ABC shot of the Ferris wheel coming up over the cotton bowl and, Welcome to the Red River Shootout, which is what it still goes by in my household. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Always shoot out. Always. I, I would think, how 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 serious can this be? There's a carnival going on around <laughs> here. Like, how serious can this be? And uh, the answer is pretty darn serious. <laughs> pretty darn serious, as it turns out. I mean, it is insane. Um, okay, so any other takeaways from SEC Media Days up to this point? Um, I think Tennessee's they got a real wild card feel about them. They, they could go 11 and one, seven and five. And it's just all contingent on quarterback play, which is what you say about most teams. The difference with them is they've, uh, they've got a staff that two years ago proved with Hendon hooker. If you give them pretty good quarterback ability, they'll squeeze that sponge until there's not a drop left in it. And they had the number one offense in the country two years ago. And then Joe Milton steps in and all of a sudden, I think the, the public thought that was a reverting back to what the norm will be. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I think that the guy they have now, from a tools perspective, is above it. He's probably above and beyond anyone Heupel's ever had, to hear them tell it. 
But the thing that they've been most aggressive with, and we did our show from there in the spring too, they were so aggressive about talking up how good they feel about their defensive staff, how good they feel about year-over-year -year defensive front recruiting, which is not something that's synonymous with Tennessee. And then the third thing is they didn't want to talk about his in, they didn't want to talk about his tangibles. They made it a point to say, hey, NIL, he's a big earner. He probably came here in part because of that. And it's part of what we were just cautioning about a little while ago. Uh, but they said he's he's grabbed the program by the shirt collar. He's taken the keys. He's run with them. Um, I wonder about that because they didn't bring him to media days. Maybe it's just because he's young. I don't know. Uh, so that's a great unknown because no one talks their players down in spring and summer. And I, I get that. So I've built up a little callus to that. But you can also read between the lines when someone's real and when they're just selling you something that, you know, their SID put together on a one sheet. And it feels real there. If it's real, that week four game where they go to Oklahoma is the biggest kind of under the radar swing game to me in the conference this year. Yeah. That yeah. one, I mean, think about the winner of that one coming out of that one of those two teams will be talked about way more seriously than they're being talked about now. Wow. Ole Miss, are they going to live up to the hype? I mean, all those transfers that Lane Kiffin has in, big-time players on the defensive end, got Walter Nolan, Prince down there at the edge, and then Jackson Dart. A lot of people are expecting him to be the surprising Heisman you know, candidate. Do you think Lane Kiffin could finally get over the hump and win those big games that he hasn't in the past? Yeah, I think um, I think the answer is he can. Do, do me a favor, Chip. Can you turn to Ole Misses? I want to do a little exercise with you right quick. So I want you to look. Uh, week one, Furman, Middle Tennessee, Wake Forest, Georgia Tech. In the NFL, they call that a preseason. <laughs> <laughs> They've got a preseason that they get to play. And so my, my point there is when you start looking up and down that schedule, the games that make you go, ooh, there's one of them at LSU. There's a bye. Oklahoma at home, there'll be a point spread favorite in. You've got the Georgia game there. That one makes you go, ooh. Point being, you know, if they, if they get through this stuff and they don't trip up against the Kentuckys or the South Carolinas of the world, you've got room to lose a game, maybe two games, which begs the question to me, uh, what's a successful season for them? What's getting over the hump? No one's been able to define it for me because the thing about it is they've finished the last two years good enough to have made a 12-team playoff. So they, their level of play, if they do nothing more than copy and paste it, is already good enough to make the playoff. So to me, if you're telling me you've got your best team you've had, don't you have to do more than you've done to have it be a success which means don't you have to make the playoff and at least win a game to me that's that's like the line of demarcation if they're the you know the nine seed with a 10 and 2 record but the two losses were to the big teams you just mentioned and then they get knocked out in round one of the playoffs for a roster like this that's not a successful year yeah that's just that's the altitude you're living at right now yeah josh great stuff man um Really, really appreciate the time. You're doing fantastic work. Everybody, if they're not already watching Late Kick with Josh Pate, um, they need to be because you're, you're doing it, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And now? You having I've any got, fun in Big D, Dallas? I uh, Look, I didn't know they were going to put me in a hotel that had a window overlooking Daly Plaza. Wasn't expecting that. Never been there before. I thought I'd have to, you know, Uber to go to that place. Instead, I just have to walk out of the elevator to go to that place. It's been fun, though. It's been unique. I know we're moving back to Atlanta, I think, for this next year. So I wonder if they're going to continue to do that or if it was just a, here's a, you know, here's an extra, here's a little bonus for you. For, you join the conference, you get a media day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if you build an NFL stadium, yeah. you get a Super yeah, Bowl. Like, if, you know, Joe Washington, you guys want to join? We'll do this in Seattle one year. Appreciate it, man. Yes, sir. Appreciate you guys. Josh, Thank hey, you, Josh. he is uh, he's the man. He is a go-to voice in uh, in college football.